Modern birds are an insanely diverse group. From teeny tiny hummingbirds to the giant flashy cassowary, from the fuzzy looking oddball kiwi to penguins, the speedy swimmers of the sea. Birds are pretty amazing. They have a global distribution, live in the coldest and hottest places on earth, migrate incredible distances, and even fly higher than the peak of Mount Everest. They were such a special group that back in the 1700s, Carolus Linnaeus assigned them to their very own group, aves. You might be wondering what place a lesson on birds has in a course on dinosaurs. But it is the fact that birds are dinosaurs that makes them key to developing a deep understanding of pretty much everything about dinosaurs, even those that went extinct over 66 million years ago. Birds are dinosaurs because when we plug them into cladistic analyses of vertebrate evolution, the most parsimonious position for them is deep within dinosauria. If we put on our evolutionary or phylogenetic glasses, just like paleontologists do, we define dinosauria as any animal that is the descendant of the most recent common ancestor of the theropod megalosaurus and the ornithopod iguanodon. It doesn't matter what the size or shape of an animal might be. It doesn't matter whether it lived millions of years ago or right now. Over the past 50 years, the most important development for dinosaur scientists has been this simple truth. Birds, all birds, fossil birds, modern birds, big birds, small birds, flightless birds, and yes, even swimming birds, they are all dinosaurs. Back when Linnaeus originally defined aves, there were a suite of characteristics that distinguished flying birds from all other known animals. You can probably list the few most obvious ones yourself. Birds have beaks instead of teeth. They have feathers, gorgeous coverings that are great for flying, for display, for warmth, and even for waterproofing. They have wings made of specialized feathers hanging from their arm bones and they have feet that are often good for perching. If we peel back the surface features of birds and take a deeper look inside their bodies, a few more important features of their anatomy highlight additional specializations. Their bones are very thin with hollow spaces on the insides, a feature that makes them quite lightweight. One of the critical bones in the wrists of birds is a little half moon shaped bone called the semilunate carpal that allows them to fold their wings and helps power the flight stroke. At least for flying birds, their bony sternum is broad and keeled forward to form what looks like a sharp blade to accommodate powerful flight muscles. When you have a chicken breast for dinner, you're eating those muscles. Birds don't have a long bony tail like lizards, but instead have a short little stubby tail made of fused tail vertebrae. Bones are fused in other parts of their skeleton too. Birds have fewer individual skull bones than most other reptiles, and their hip elements get fused together seamlessly into a structure called the sacrum. One of the most important bone fusions is found in the clavicle, called the furcula. This is the wishbone, the same bone that you may pull and make a wish with at Thanksgiving. Beyond their bones, birds also have a unique anatomy that supports their special way of breathing. Instead of a set of soft and pliable lungs, birds have rigid lungs that are connected to a series of air sacs. Some of these air sacs lie within the cavities of their bodies, and some of them perforate their vertebrae and bones to invest these hollow elements with air, helping circulate air and also contributing to a reduced body mass for flight. Take a deep breath in and out. As mammals, we think we're pretty awesome, but when we breathe, we leave a ton of air hanging out in our relatively wimpy lungs. Birds breathe very differently. Instead of an inhale-exhale pattern, they use a circular pattern. Their initial breath bypasses the lungs and fills air sacs, where some oxygen is extracted. The next breath pushes that air into a different set of air sacs, where more oxygen is extracted. The next breath pushes that same air into the lungs, where even more oxygen is drawn out. As a result, birds are far more efficient extractors of oxygen than mammals are, which might help fuel their high metabolism, rapid growth rates, and maybe their warm-blooded bodies. 
One of the predictions that Darwin made about evolution by natural selection was that if his theory was correct, we should find transitional forms in the fossil record, creatures that could not easily fit into existing taxonomic categories because they exhibited characteristics of more than one group. Just two years after Darwin's publication of Origin of Species, just such a specimen was discovered in Jurassic Age Solenholfen limestone Lagerstadt. The first hint was a single fossil feather preserved as a carbonized impression amongst amazingly preserved fish, invertebrates, and plants. Soon after, an entire skeleton emerged from the rocks, a skeleton with the toothed skull and long bony tail of a reptile, but with the feathers and wings akin to those in living birds. This remarkable new animal was called Archaeopteryx, a name that translates to ancient wing. Sir Thomas Huxley, who gained the nickname of Darwin's Bulldog, touted the discovery around England as great evidence for Darwin's new theory of evolution. Over the next hundred years, many more specimens of the mysterious Archaeopteryx would be uncovered at Solenhofen. Each specimen was preserved in different postures and with different details, leading to a much more complete understanding of the animal's distinctive anatomy. So many features pointed to a link between dinosaurs and birds, but for years, one critical element appeared to be missing. Where was the Archaeopteryx wishbone? This tiny, fragile little element embedded in the muscle of the shoulder joint appeared absent in the assembled Archaeopteryx specimens. For many scientists at the time, the perceived lack of a furcula in both Archaeopteryx and theropod dinosaurs eliminated the possibility that these two groups of animals could be related. And it changed the way we viewed dinosaurs for years to come as overgrown, slow-moving, cold-blooded beasts with their tails dragging on the ground. This idea of the overgrown reptile dictated the perception of dinosauria in both science and the public until the early 1960s, when a young Yale paleontologist named John Ostrom made a discovery that would introduce the way we now think about dinosaurs. One afternoon in late August 1964, John was prospecting for fossils in the Cloverly Formation, an outcrop of early Cretaceous sedimentary rocks in southern Montana. The field season was drawing to a close, and Ostrom was thinking about where his team might begin their work the following summer. Eyes to the ground, suddenly Ostrom and his assistant, Grant E. Meyer, noticed a black, shiny bone sticking out from the rocky slope a few feet below them. They slid down to the bone-bearing horizon and realized that they were seeing a large, sharp-clawed dinosaur hand. They were so excited that they dropped down to their knees and began plucking bits of rock away using only their hands and pocket knives. As the specimen was exposed, they started to spot the sharp serrated teeth of a theropod dinosaur. They returned with excavation tools the next day and continued digging, exposing a foot that would change the study of dinosaurs forever. This three-toed foot had two toes with ordinary claws, but the innermost toe was tipped by a large, sickle-shaped, deadly claw. The slashing arc provided the fodder for the name that Ostrom would eventually bestow upon his new theropod. He called it Deinonychus, which means terrible claw. The next few years found Ostrom and his team continuing to excavate the Cloverly site for two more summertime field seasons and three long years studying and reconstructing the detailed anatomy of at least four Deinonychus individuals recovered from the same area. In 1969, Ostrom published his work and ditched the cold-blooded dino stereotype in favor of a, quote, fleet-footed, highly predaceous, extremely agile, and very active animal, sensitive to many stimuli and quick in its responses, end quote. One of the undergraduate student members of the 1964 expedition, a young paleontologist named Robert Bacher, contributed a drawing to accompany Ostrom's paper. The illustration depicted Deinonychus in full sprint, with its terrible claw uplifted and its sharp clawed hands curled, ready for grasping prey. The discovery, the paper, and the imagery would launch a revolution in dinosaur biology that we paleontologists call the dinosaur renaissance. Ostrom continued his research, and during museum visits in Europe in the 1970s, he realized the similarities in the detailed articulations and anatomy 
of the skeletons of Deinonychus and Archaeopteryx. This detailed anatomical study prompted Ostrom to revive the old hypothesis championed by Thomas Huxley that birds were descended from theropod dinosaurs like Deinonychus. He laid out more than 20 different anatomical similarities between Archaeopteryx and theropod dinosaurs. Ostrom spent his later years out of the field, instead working at the Yale Peabody Museum. He always believed that the best discoveries are made in museum storerooms. And for the next 30 years of his career, he published paper after paper detailing the connections between dinosaurs, birds, and the evolution of flight. Other major contributors to the dinosaur renaissance included the work of Robert Bakker, who published The Dinosaur Heresies in 1986. This book pushed the ideas of the active, agile dinosaur with an almost evangelical fervor. At the same time, Jack Horner, a Montana native who never graduated from college, was busy finding the first North American baby dinosaurs and nests. Suddenly, not only were dinosaurs more active, like birds, they were also good parents. Jack published his book, Digging Dinosaurs, a pop science summary of his work in 1988. As the 1990s got rolling, the Canadian paleontologist Philip Curry began working with scientists in China who revealed the very first discoveries of feathered dinosaurs. John Ostrom saw these first feathery fossils at the annual Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting at the American Museum of Natural History in 1996. For those of us in the room, witnessing his emotional reaction to seeing the literal confirmation of his work was a moment never to be forgotten. Today, there is no question that birds share anatomical features with dinosaurs because they inherited them from their common ancestor. They represent a true evolutionary group. Birds are dinosaurs. It's not just a fun catchphrase, it's the truth. It turns out that since Ostrom's pioneering work, many of the features that were historically considered specific to birds get smeared deep down into the dinosaur family tree. Let's talk through some of the most compelling bits of evidence linking these groups of animals. Feathers might, at first glance, seem pretty simple, but they're actually complicated biological structures. They're built of a central rachis with projecting barbs linked together by barbules and tiny little structures called hooklets. The connections between the barbs is partly what dictates the shape of the feather. From the flight and tail feathers of birds, to downy, fluffy, insulating feathers, to bristles and decorative phyloplumes. Our fossil record indicates that the first feathers evolved in a specific group of theropod dinosaurs called Solurosaurs. This group includes Tyrannosaurs, Ornithomimids, Therizinosaurs, and Compsognathids. Dinosaur feathers are often fuzzy and downy looking, making even big dinosaurs like U. Tyrannus with eight inch long downy feathers look fluffy and cute. In a few dinosaurs, like the tiny Microraptor, primary feathers are present on the arms and legs. In other dinosaurs, like Velociraptor, direct evidence of feathers is the presence of little bumps on the ulna, called quill knobs, where feathers articulated with the arm bones. The deeper we dig into the dinosaur family tree, the evidence for feathers gets less common, while the evidence for a wider array of special skin adaptations gets even more interesting. Paul Barrett, my colleague and keeper of Dinosauria at the Natural History Museum in London, studied a sample of dinosaur species where skin impressions exist and mapped them out onto an evolutionary tree. Animals like sauropods, hadrosaurs, ceratopsians, ankylosaurs, and stegosaurs likely didn't have feathers. We have a lot of skin impressions of these animals and all exhibit scaly skin. In a few rare instances, other kinds of skin adaptations have been recovered in dinosaurs, like the specialized quills on the tail of a little ceratopsian. But these unique cases map out parsimoniously as independently evolved, another example of convergent evolution, in which dinosaurs have lots of cool options for fancy adaptations of their skin. The data support the idea that feathers first evolved in a subgroup of theropods. It's likely that the original feathers were downy and not used for flight, 
but instead served other functions, like to keep warm or for display. Remember all of those features of bones in birds that we discussed at the top of this lesson? It turns out that many of these features can be found deep down in the dinosaur family tree, some so far back that they branch into a much broader group of dinosaurs. For instance, the wing-folding, flight-stroking bone called the semilunate carpal is also present in the subgroup of theropods that includes Deinonychus and Velociraptor, a group known as the Manoraptora. This little half-moon-shaped wrist bone changes the way that these theropods can move their hands. Instead of just up and down, the semilunate carpal allows side-to-side -side and rotational movements. This bone is the reason that the raptors in Jurassic Park can open doors. And though wishbones seem to be absent in theropod dinosaurs for many years, we since realized they were present all along. They've just been misidentified in many of the theropods that have them. Now we have furculae from early Jurassic theropod dinosaurs, indicating that this feature is a pretty ancient part of the theropod body plan. What about those short little tails of birds? Some theropod dinosaurs that are more closely related to birds also have them. A recently discovered species of Ovaraptorosaur is the first theropod to exhibit a short little bony tail made up of fused tailbones, just like that of modern flying birds. Even further back evolutionarily, the vertebrae of both theropod and sauropod dinosaurs exhibit perforations on their surfaces and in internal hollows that correspond to the pneumatic vertebrae of birds today. This is cool because it also points to the presence of air sacs similar to those connected to the lungs in modern birds. In sauropods, the presence of such air sacs lightens the estimated body mass of these behemoths by as much as 10%. If hollow vertebrae are consistent with the presence of air sacs, this is a good indication that avian-style airflow may have been present in both theropods and sauropods, pushing the origin of this innovation way back to the base of the Sariscian family tree. As you'll recall, this novel way of extracting oxygen is linked to high rates of metabolism in living birds which correspond to a warm-blooded lifestyle and super-fast growth rates. Analysis of the microscopic structure of both Sariscian and Ornithischian dinosaurs indicates high vascularity and cell densities, disorganized bone mineral, and abundant bone remodeling, all of which are consistent with a more mammalian or avian growth strategy than reptiles. This may indicate baseline metabolic rates that were elevated in all dinosaurs and points to birds inheriting at least a bump up in growth and metabolic strategies from their ancient dinosaur precursors. The preservation of soft tissues in some fossils also supports the connection between dinosaurs and birds. Beta keratin, the unique protein that builds feathers, beaks, and claw sheaths in modern birds, has been preserved on the sickle-shaped toe claw sheath of the 66 million year old theropod from Madagascar and work on Tyrannosaurus rex fossils has revealed the presence of amino acids that are consistent with those of modern chickens. As modern evolutionary developmental biologists work hard to decipher the genomes of living birds, they've also found evidence of extinct genes in living chickens that in earlier evolutionary history would have built teeth and long bony tails. In this way, the genome of living birds preserves a molecular fossil record that allows us to test hypotheses about the ways that mutations changed gene expression millions of years ago to result in novel morphologies. Finally, just for fun, we also have great evidence for birdie behavior from dinosaurs. One of my favorites is the discovery of an oviraptorid sitting atop a nest of eggs. The original discoveries in Mongolia of these dinosaurs associated with nests prompted early workers to name the first such theropods Oviraptor, a nod to the idea that these big, bad meat-eaters were stealing eggs from the nests of unassuming herbivorous dinos. Imagine the surprise of the scientists who finally popped open one of the well-preserved fossil eggs to find a baby Oviraptor inside. Contrary to the name, these egg thieves might actually have been great parents, sitting atop their nests and caring for their unhatched young. 
And we can't forget about the duck-sized juvenile troodontid theropod discovered in Liaoning Province, China. This tiny fossil is complete from head to toe and preserved in exquisite three-dimensional detail. The hind legs are folded beneath the body, much like the roosting posture for modern birds. The head is tucked under one of the forelimbs and the tail wraps forward, circling the body. Scientists proposed that this dino was preserved while it was asleep. The pose prompted the name Mai Long, which translates to soundly sleeping dragon. All of the evidence is piled up. Birds really are dinosaurs. To conclude today's lesson, here are some of the most common questions I get asked about dinosaurs. With our newfound perspective, we can now give some more insightful answers. Everyone always wants to know what the biggest dinosaur was. This is one place where those fossil dinosaurs still have their bird descendants beat. You know that it is likely to be a sauropod, probably something like Argentinosaurus. But what if someone asks you, what's the smallest dinosaur? Now your answer can't just be based back in the Mesozoic with the non-flying dinosaurs. Technically, the smallest dino so far known is the minuscule bee hummingbird, weighing only about two grams, about the same as a dime. What if someone wants to know if we could splice dino and frog DNA to make a dinosaur as they did in Jurassic Park? You can now put your knowledge to work and answer, frog genomes would never do the trick. All we need to do to make a dinosaur is to manipulate the DNA of living dinosaurs, the birds. Scientists are already pushing at the limits of this field, not to recreate extinct dinosaurs, but to understand the genetic underpinnings of the transition from dinosaur to bird. If a friend asks you, what's the fastest dinosaur? Your answer might need a follow-up. Do they mean the fastest terrestrial runner or the fastest flyer? If a terrestrial runner, you can quickly rule out big extinct theropods like T. rex. They were just too big to be very fast. You might compare and contrast extinct and modern dinosaurs with similar body plans and similar masses. Maybe some of the smaller theropods could have given a modern ostrich a run for its money. We estimate that, like ostriches, at least a few of these fleet-footed extinct dinos probably topped out around 45 or 50 miles per hour. However, if your friend is thinking only about movement, then the hands-down winner is the modern flying dinosaur, the peregrine falcon which can dive at speeds more than 200 miles per hour. One question that my college students always want to know the answer to, what's the smartest dinosaur? You'll have to answer this one honestly. It's pretty much impossible to know for sure how intelligent different ancient dinosaurs were, but among living birds, it would probably be those problem-solving, tool-using crows, the language-learning parrots, or the vocalization imitators like the superb lyrebird. And my personal favorite, if someone asks you, did T-Rex taste like chicken? You can confidently answer, no, chicken tastes like T-Rex. <laughs>